This is part four of Understanding Islam, Unpacking the Shahada. And this, the subject of this part is what is the Sharia? What is Sharia? Sharia is an Arabic word which means the way or a path. Remember, Islam is all about being rightly guided. And a very powerful metaphor in Islam is staying on the path of, rightly, of right guidance, walking on the correct path. Satan tries to take people off the right path, to derail them. And the Sharia is the way to be a submitter. What happened was that the early Muslim scholars studied the Quran and the life of Muhammad in all the materials that existed, and they distilled all that material to make a system of rules for life. They worked out where there were contradictions, what to do about it. They generalized where there wasn't enough said to explain things. And um, this system of rules for life is called the Sharia, or the pathway uh, to follow to be a Muslim. There are differences in different schools of, of Sharia. There's four Sunni schools, four different main schools of Sunni Islam. They differ, but in, in small ways. They're largely in agreement about all the most important things. And there are also very Shia, there are various Shiite schools of uh, Sharia as well. Uh, Shiite Islam and Sunni Islam share a great deal in common because they're built on the same base of the Quran and the Sunnah, uh, but they, are, they do have some differences as well. If you wanted to get a sense of what the Sharia law looks like as a totality, you could get the reliance of the traveler, uh, which is translated by uh, an American uh, convert to Islam. And it, uh, it has a, like an encyclopedia uh, of Shafi'i law, this, the sort of law that's followed in Southeast Asia and, and in Egypt and parts of Africa. Uh, and it's a very interesting way of getting an overview of the, all the different issues. It's organized according to different kinds of, of topics. Mustafa Cedric is, uh, was a, a, a mufti in Bosnia, and uh, he had this very helpful comment to make about Sharia. Sometimes people say Sharia law, and they think of some medieval legal code. That's quite misleading. He said, you know what Sharia means? It means to be kind to your neighbor, to be nice, to uphold certain moral standards. And that means to tell the truth, to be just, to be pleasant to others, to be giving to others. This is Sharia. I cannot disavow myself from the Sharia. Asking me what do you think about Sharia is asking me why are you a Muslim. So what he's saying is ethics is part of Sharia. The daily customs are part of Sharia. The fundamentals of your belief and Islamic practice are part of Sharia. You can't have Islamic law without Sharia. Um, every, every Muslim to some degree who practices their faith is to some degree Sharia compliant. Um, because that is, that is what the pathway is. That is Islam. You can't, he says, you can't, I can't divorce myself as a Muslim from Sharia law. And the very important question then is, what does Sharia consist of? How extensive is it? And what implications does it have for people who live by the Sharia? Let me give you an example of um, how Sharia relates to the Hadiths. This is a hadith uh, from uh, the book of uh, Manners, I believe, from Sahih Muslim. And Abu Huraira, who was a friend of Muhammad, he reported that Allah's messenger, Muhammad, may peace be upon him. It's customary for Muslims to bless Muhammad every time he's referred to. Uh, he reported him as saying, the rider should first greet the pedestrian, and the pedestrian the one who's seated, and a small group should greet a large group. So when I was living in Aceh, and I'd be walking along the road, if someone came to me on a motorbike, the protocol was that the person on the motorbike should initiate the greeting and then the pedestrian would respond. And if I happened to see a friend on a motorbike and I waved to them, they'd almost fall off their bike waving to me back because I'd caught them out, you know. And it does mean that if you're riding along, I mean, obviously they didn't have motorbikes in Muhammad's time, but the analogy is extended. If you're riding along on your horse or your motorbike, you have to keep a lookout in case you see someone you know and greet them pretty quickly. So um, these are the rules for who initiates the greeting uh, in, in which circumstance. So someone who's standing and walking by, if they see someone seated, they're the one that should initiate the greeting. So that's, this is Sharia. Uh, it's, a, it's rules for who says hello to who first. We have those rules in our culture. Does the man shake the woman's hand or vice versa? And who do you introduce to whom? I don't really know what all those rules are. I'm a little bit uncouth. I'm being Australian, I suppose. Um, but, uh, but, but in Islam, these things are part of the religion. Now, here's another example, a more serious example. Time uh, magazine in June the, 12th, June the 17th, 2002, carried this report. 
An Islamic court in Nigeria has ordered that Amina Lawal, who bore a child more than nine months after her divorce, not be executed by stoning until 2003 when her baby is weaned. It's just a little passage in Time magazine. And there was a lot of discussion about this case around that time, and some people said, oh, this is a medieval law code, it's not true Islam, it doesn't reflect Islam, it's a perversion, it's extremism. And the question that I would ask you is, why would the court rule the stoning, and why would they wait until the baby is weaned? And the answer to that is Muhammad. Yeah, the answer is Muhammad. Let's have a look at the hadiths. You could do this yourself. You could go online and you could uh, find a collection of hadiths and you could do a search for stoning uh, or weaning or something like that and you'd find it. So this is a tradition uh, from the hadiths. There came to Muhammad a woman from Gamid and said, Allah's messenger, I have committed adultery, so purify me. Now she's asking for atonement. She's committed a sin and she wants to be cleansed from the sin. Muhammad turned her away. In Islam, you're not supposed to confess a sin if no one else knows about it. It's actually one of the, one of the things that allow you to lie in Islam. You're not supposed to self, to implicate yourself. It's, you're forbidden. Muhammad often rebuked people for confessing a sin that no one knew about. So he turned her away. On the following day, she said, Allah's messenger, why do you turn me away? By Allah, I have become pregnant. He said, well, if you insist upon it, then go away until you give birth. When she was delivered, she came with the child wrapped in a rag and said, here is the child who I've given birth to. She still wants atonement. He said, go away and suckle him until you wean him. When she'd weaned him, she came back to Muhammad with the child who was holding a piece of bread in his hand. So he's eating food. She said, Allah's apostle, here he is. I've weaned him. He eats food. And Muhammad entrusted the child to one of the Muslims and then pronounced punishment. She was put in her, a ditch up to her chest and he commanded people and they stoned her. So notice that those judges in the Sharia court in northern Nigeria were ruling in accordance with the example of Muhammad. They were ruling in accordance with Sharia law. And interestingly, in Islamic law, those hudud penalties, cutting off the hand or stoning the adulterer, they are regarded as purificating, as uh, atonement. And recently, um, a cleric, a Canadian Muslim cleric, was recorded saying that uh, these laws are good because they allow uh, Muslim believers to be purified before, so they can go to paradise in a good state. So, so it's actually an incredible blessing uh, for people to be uh, stoned or to have their hands or, or feet cut off uh, because they are purified. That's atonement and the way it works. So notice that the penalty is due to Muhammad. The exemption about the weaning, is that's an example of the mercy of Allah, that the, child, the mother is not killed until the child is weaned. So this is Sharia as well. And one of the challenges is if, if Muslims say we need to live under Sharia law, the question is how much Sharia law? Is it possible to have a little bit or a large bit? And where does it stop? Where do the boundaries exist? And how does that work? Sharia and religious freedom. The Sharia law requires an Islamicized society. Because after all, who's going to stone the adulterers? The state has to. Or is, is your, are your neighbors going to do it? And if they do that, the state would punish them unless it's allowed. Um, one uh, person complained that in a, in a Western society, um, a father can't compel his son to be a Muslim. He can't beat his son if he doesn't pray. It's illegal to do that. But in an Islamic society, it's his duty to do that, to compel obedience to Islam from a child. Uh, Sharia law includes warfare against unbelievers. It's part of Sharia law to fight against non-Muslims. So the jihad is part of Sharia. And John Garang, who is the former Sudan People's Liberation Movement leader, he asked this question. I asked this very important question. Is the jihad a religious right of those who declare and wage it or is it a violation of the human rights of the people against whom it's declared and waged? Southern Sudan has lost more than a million people to the jihad, uh, which was declared by the northern part of Sudan. And um, the Christians in the south were fighting, really, in order not to live under Sharia law. And what happened was that the north then implemented genocidal warfare policies. And um, there are still more than 30,000 southern Christian uh, Sudanese who are held as slaves in northern Sudan, a, 
uh, they were taken captive in raids and um, that's still a huge human rights issue. Encourage your churches to be aware of this and to pray for them, pray that they will be redeemed from their slavery. And here's the question, you know, if a religious freedom for Muslim means living under Sharia law, that means a Muslim, a radical Muslim who really wants to follow Islam will never be free, will never have full religious freedom until Islamic law is the law of the land, until the state implements Sharia. It's an issue of religious freedom. A Muslim man in Melbourne complained that the state awarded custody of the child to his wife, whereas in, according to his religion he had custody of the child. So his religion was being impeded by the state. He couldn't practice his religion freely in Australia. So you see, when we speak about religious freedom and Islam, this raises deep question of human rights. And uh, another example is when the Archbishop of Canterbury said we should embrace is Islamic law, he was consigning Muslim women to the Sharia courts and assigning them to second-class citizenship in the, in the UK. You can access the life of Muhammad, but it's more difficult than the life of Jesus. The Gospels and the life of Christ are public truth. Millions of people, 1.5 billion people in the world are Muslims, and in theory they're imitating Muhammad and following him. The primary sources are hard to access. They've been harder in the past, although it's now changing with the Internet. Very few have the skills to read these materials. Common understandings of Islam are sanitized. So Khatija, uh, the story of Muhammad's child bride, often the misleading accounts. Um, the, sorry, Khatija, uh, the story of Muhammad's first wife. People often um, overemphasize how much older she was than him. Uh, Safiya and Raihana were two women, Jewish women, that he picked up and made his concubines and then his wives when he killed their relatives and drove their relatives out. Um, Aisha, his child bride, he married when she was six and consummated that when he was nine. A lot of, when she was nine, a lot of those stories are sanitized and sort of brushed over, airbrushed. Accurate information is offensive often. Information about Muhammad is not democratized. So it's a real challenge accessing all this information. That's the end of that session.